to achieving certain objective, which is the sustainable development. So that we before we borrow the, or, or the borrower will have to ensure okay this money will be utilized only for this purpose, and there will be outcome. This could be measurable, and there will be an impact. So this is why this this funding, although those are being developed, a uh, little more costlier and little more complex than normal financial instruments. This is a challenge, and this is where a lot of countries are be basically developing the taxonomy, developing mechanisms and guidelines to ensure that the investor will get the necessary information, and investor will will be ensured that you know this money would be utilized properly and effectively only for that purpose. This is what uh, the, we are trying to develop in our roadmap also to for us to attract all this money which are available. In fact, those are all you know, limited resources. We have to be ahead in the game. Otherwise, there are a lot of demand for this, this kind of resources. But some countries are already developing those taxonomies, developing guidelines so that they would be eligible. They are also trying to develop these things with help of probably the UNESCO can help us. Already working with the IFC and our, our team uh, in the central bank are working. Uh, and also, the, there are, could be different kind of requirements from other regulators. For example, for the central bank, we are looking at the bank side and global finance initiatives like ISB. Now, one example is that there's a green bond, uh, international sovereign bonds on green financing. So, when you issue a normal ISB, is we issue a memorandum and there are lead managers, they go and raise money. Once the money comes in, no one is interested, you know, investor wouldn't interest that how money has been used broadly. It's their interest is only get the return, get interest on time and the capital would be written. But in this case, it's not the case. It's much more complicated, a lot of legal requirements are there, a lot of commitments should be there. It will have to be a proper established accreditation and, and monetary mechanism that would be accepted by all these providers of one. And that's a challenge. And that's what we are trying to develop, uh, and that will certainly help all the financial institutions, low, uh, private financial institutions, and commercial banks, and others, as well as the for the government, if they intend to raise green bonds, uh, even ISBs on global market, that we need to have this mechanism. I think that's where we are working on. Okay, uh, Sujiva, can I turn to you? Uh, you have been president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, plus you run an audit firm, right? On the on the there's a lot of good practices floating around. But is there now an opportunity of actually regulating some of this so that companies are forced to look at it seriously? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. looking at from the insurance point of view now, they, they, I know, although because I, I'm the, uh, you know, I don't get directly involved now, but I'm aware that they are quite doing quite a lot of things, especially we being the uh, one of the, uh, you know, the uh, member organizations of IFAC, instead of, uh, you know, the supreme body of the accountants in the globe. And they have already issued certain uh, guidelines, pronouncements, uh, where we are supposed to carry out those. So where the regulations are concerned, obviously, you know, when we issue a certain, uh, uh, let us say, uh, accounting standards and things like that, you know, that becomes finally low, Dinesh. So yeah. as a result, uh, the corporate sector or the preparers of these financial statements, or we as auditors, that we are supposed to... Uh, uh, you know, abide by all those rules, yeah. regulations, and things like that, which will certainly come into effect uh, within in due course. Okay. Uh, now, Vajra, you are the one who uh, generally the the cop in the private sector. You normally police all these things, right? Uh, in terms of compliance, uh, what are your what are your thoughts around that, and what more can we do in terms of uh, complying with some of these standards? Okay. Uh, I think uh, in terms of. Uh, sustainable financing, if I may uh, uh, sp speak about the global uh, 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 context, the um, ISCO, which is the Global Standard Setter for Securities Reg uh, Regulation, actually recognize supporting sustainable financing through capital markets yeah, yeah. is a uh, focus area. And at the uh, Emerging Markets uh, Conference that was held in Sri Lanka, they set up a, a working group and that report was uh, released this year, okay. where it, how it encourages regulators and exchangers to support sustainable uh, financing. So I think if you also look at the global uh, uh, arena, we have seen the area of interest and focus has been raising funds through green bonds. And if you really look at the figures, in 2012, only about 5 billion was raised. and 
uh, in 2018, about 250 billion, and they uh, estimate by 2020, a trillion dollars would have been raised through green bonds. So that really shows that uh, there's a great interest. And also from a uh, Sri Lankan perspective, also the capital market has a great uh, important role to play, especially in terms of raising finance through green bonds. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, a green when you say a green bond, it is very similar to a conventional bond. It's only that yeah, the yeah. proceeds are invested in, a, uh, yeah. in projects that generate climate or yeah. uh, envir uh, environment benefits. So yeah. uh, that's on the debt side. But, and on the uh, equity side, I think already a lot of companies realize that uh, voluntarily disclosing their ES. But the line may be concessionary. Sorry? The line, the credit line will be concessionary since it's a green bond. No, but, yeah. uh, but the thing is, yeah. I mean, if you really look at the structure yeah. the, uh, and the returns, yeah. I mean, More globally they're quite uh, similar. Okay. So it's just that the objective of yeah. the proceeds being invested in these specific uh, bonds are, okay. uh, the, the, that's the difference. And in the, on the equity side, as I said, uh, a lot of companies, I think, voluntarily disclose the, their ESG-related uh, okay. matters, which, as a result, <laughs> Uh, you know, there is an uh, uh, increase in the, the reputation, reputation trust, yes. and also it attracts investors. Yeah. And I think from a uh, uh, capital market perspective, it has to be demand-driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, uh, for instance, uh, BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager uh, in the world, yeah. they, uh, all global asset managers now incorporate ESG guidelines in analyzing investment yeah. uh, decision-making. So I, I think that is the way to really okay. promote companies also mm. to disclose these ESG related uh, matters and also if you really look at the uh, emerging market in terms of returns, mm. uh, research shows that uh, the returns have been higher mm. uh, of companies that focus on ESG related matters and also their PE multiples are also higher which means that a investor is willing to pay a higher premium right. okay. for such companies. Okay. Now Ray, I saw you nodding. So, do you agree with that? Is there a correlation between yeah. companies that are environmentally uh, responsible? Yeah, definitely, I <laughs> see from a global perspective that the world has moved far ahead than where we are in terms of recognizing uh, sustainability. And also, uh, if you look at the kind of funds that have been raised, uh, there are initiatives such as the principles of responsible uh, investments where there is uh, about 1,900 fund managers that manage over $8 trillion uh, in, 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 in for funds that are invested specifically for green. There's about 95% of that ma money must be invested specifically in green-related uh, uh, bonds. So sustainability, I mean, although we from 2015 have uh, sort of gone in to that area, we've been trying to develop our own uh, uh, sort of uh, framework, the mechanism. What we lack, I think, as the earlier speakers also spoke of, I think Mr. Andalal also spoke of, is that we need to now get moving on and then launch our own green bonds. I think that's that's critical. Uh, we've been talking because most of the countries in the region, uh, be it Vietnam, uh, India, both BSC and NSC, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, have all launched uh, bonds and very successfully traded. So I think it's time that we also look at the framework. One thing that I sort of cross-checked as to why what has uh, what has inhibited us from launching the green bond, uh, launching a green bond, is that I'm told that the costs have been slightly high, and that the are in we will we we do we probably don't have the wherewithal on our own. To, to launch it. So I, I think it might be good that we need to partner somebody like an SNP, which would entail uh, higher, higher costs uh, being associated or aligned with somebody like that. In in light of that, I think it might be good to, for us to see whether we can attract regional companies, uh, firms in Bangladesh and Malaysia, uh, Maldives, to be a part of this and have a regional index. Uh, this, uh, I think, uh, Doctor earlier suggested that should we, we should look at a separate listing for green companies. And yeah. since you say there is so much of appetite for uh, foreign companies to invest in these green companies, is there a possibility of 
at least identifying these companies and and giving them yeah. a separate. I think uh, locally, Mr. Virapati, yeah, I mean, yeah. we have about six companies yeah. already listed, six or seven companies. They are listed in renewable energy with a market cap of yeah. about 0.7%. So I think it's negligible yeah. in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, but I, the, that's exactly the point I was making. I don't know whether locally we have the wherewithal to be able to attract yeah. funds to come into this thing. I think we've got the infrastructure, we've got the mechanism, I'm sure the rules, the regulations, all that yeah. can be covered. But we need size, we need scalability, and I'm sure these funds also will look at something that is of some significance in size, which is why we need to look first regionally. Uh, maybe Maldives, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and look at companies, uh, firms, and institutions which are now uh, gravitating towards uh, green and, um, and, and sustainability yeah. uh, reporting to be able to form a regional uh, um, uh, index here uh, that will then be more attractive to not only attractive for foreign investors, but will yeah. also be able to attract a, a rating agency like an SNP or, uh, SNP or an MSCI to partner us in that uh, foray. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, can I just ask you a quick question again? You talked a lot about PPPs and uh, private sector engagement. Uh, listening to what uh, Ray said, is there a possibility of uh, regional uh, engagement uh, to drive some of these initiatives? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you. Yes, I, I, I find it very, very interesting uh, also that um, there's a trend, right, um, an interest in developing um, green uh, financial products. At the UNS CAP, as I mentioned earlier, we developed this uh, so-called infrastructure financing and PVP network. So all these uh, green financial instruments can be issued against uh, those uh, infrastructure projects given that they are uh, uh, sustainable and climate resilient. So at SCAP, we plan and it would be an initiative that would be completed by next year, but also, again, as I said, depends on member states' engagement and willingness. And I can see that Sri Lanka is willing, um, as I see, for, they always be a member for three years. And here in this panel, also enthusiasm on climate finance um, to, uh, to finance uh, good infrastructure projects. So yes, I think, um, you see, I also feel that there's many standards, many uh, principles being put forward. We are not an organization is going to set a standards or principles. How many organizations doing that? What we would do is we will at least uh, make a judgment based on these standards to screen good projects uh, by the government that they are climate friendly, uh, green infrastructure projects to be pushed forward to be funded by private sector investors, whether Sri Lanka private sector or international uh, private sector. I understand that Sienka also have several uh, projects that can be uh, that can also be bankable, commercially viable, that can be uh, backed for these issuing green financial instruments. So we certainly, although the name of our network is on infrastructure uh, financing and PPP, but it's not about just infrastructure. It's about infrastructure related financial products that are green and climate resilient. So, yes. Okay. Uh, in the area of capacity development, and you talked about the instruments, there are mm -hmm. so many complex instruments mm -hmm. floating around. Is there any way where you can work with maybe the SCSE and the SAC to support them with some uh, capacity building initiatives and some and put some money on the table for that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we are doing capacity building workshop in at the national level also. We're going to do capital market workshop in Bhutan in December. Bhutan is also in this sub-region to facilitate them to do uh, issue first soaring green bonds. Uh, Sri Lanka is probably more advanced. You ha already have all the bonds, all the company listed, more than 200 companies listed. So it has to be at a, a different, maybe different level. Um, we've been talking to also the Ministry of Finance uh, yesterday and they have keen interest um, in wanting to raise awareness for uh, institutional investors, pensions, insurance, to invest longer terms rather than investing in uh, short-term liquid assets or um, conventional uh, bonds, but rather to uh, align their interest from shorter term to, to long term and especially towards the, the projects that are commercially viable, so that helping also the government. So 
it could be. I mean, they, we need to know what, what is the problem, right? Whether, uh, whether is the institutional investors not purely not interested, or is it the regulatory barriers that are in place and need to be addressed, or is it the macro conditions of Sri Lanka itself with um, exchange rate instability that is a problem? So, um, yes, we. I think I, I actually feel that if there is an interest in cooperation in terms of build, building capacity building or stakeholder consultations. We can certainly sit together to see how can uh, we develop better uh, better capital market uh, for Sri Lanka. Okay. Uh, before I uh, turn to Nikhil, can I quickly ask you a question? What is actually holding us back, uh, with uh, uh, preventing us from issuing a sovereign green bond? I think uh, one is, is but it might be cheap also. <laughs> uh, not, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, it's cheaper. One is to, uh, you know, it's difficult is that government, if, if that's sovereign bond, government will have to identify uh, what we call a project that government would finance. So then obviously I don't see a lack of projects which can be financed through green financing in Sri Lanka. Because there are a lot of, say, renew, for example, energy sector. We have a lot of kind of cost of generating energy in Sri Lanka is relatively much higher than other countries. And also, large share of that is based on the thermal fuel. So now the advantage now with increase in technology and cost of renewable energy through wind, solar power is technology coming in, then cost per unit cost is coming in much more competitive than all this coal or everything, everyone else. But the lack of the, the challenge is that, you know, how do you identify the project and prepare the project so that that would be eligible to finance. And the initial cost would be certainly higher than the conventional ISP. But I see the it, on the long term of the life cycle of the project, that would be much more competitive and will give more social benefits in terms of overall cost of energy generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think government should be, should be willing to bear additional cost at the beginning. Uh, in launching the transaction in terms of all the complications. But there will be a net benefit over a period of time because of the cost of generation would be much lower. So there are a lot of projects. And, and what is preventing the answer to your question is that we don't have a proper framework to identify that thing. And also from the government point of view, obviously government has a competing lot of needs for financing much, you know, this project will take longer time. You know, the transaction to prepare this thing, have this thing, standards, all these things, will take a long time. Whereas the simple conventional ISP, within a one month, we can go to market and do and raise the financing. But this government is a little tighter in terms of their requirements. Okay. And what I think medium long term with our this thing, that will help. Certainly, I'm not sure the government should be should not be the first issuer in Sri Lanka. I think I'm sure the commercial banks, private sector can 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 start even before the government on a smaller scale, and then that will help the government also to initiate this thing. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll come to you, just give me a minute. N Nikhil, can I turn to you? Uh, if the corporate, corporate sector comes up with some green bonds, will the, will the insurance companies have the appetite to invest? So, so I'll speak, then they take uh, a long-term uh, view. I, generally, yes, uh, we do take a long-term view. Um, Dinesh, let me just sort of step back for a, a minute because uh, we do have a global perspective on this. We've been around for 100 years at AIA, and um, we, we feel that climate and, and sustainability is a huge initiative for us, uh, and we are investing responsibly. So short answer to your question, we've invested 700 million in green bonds already globally. Uh, we would be obviously looking at uh, those investments if they're suitable for us over here. A couple of things that we are doing very actively is there are no taxonomies. Um, yeah, maybe you can also offer some guidelines in terms of what are the parameters that... Uh, yeah. right. So yeah. there are no clear taxonomies in how to invest and how do you classify these projects. So we've created our own and I can ask our investment team to possibly share that uh, with you guys. But we do look at the ESG and climate impact very carefully before we make any investment. And I don't just mean green investment, any investment. Um, we've created a carbon footprint of all the investee companies that we have. So the entire portfolio of companies, we evaluate their carbon footprint and see how they're doing and see how our portfolio is doing in terms of being a responsible investor. Uh, in specific instances, we are very careful and we choose not to invest in some companies and, and uh, in industries 
So for instance, we're really looking carefully at coal and coal-related industries and utilities to see whether we really want to be invested in them or not. Um, and last but not least, but we've signed up for this uh, thing called uh, the Principles for Responsible Investment, and we're we are an early signatory of that. I just, one more point, Dinesh. It's all well and good to talk about investing in um, in these green bonds and, and sustainable investments. But I think we have to look inside ourselves because we are also have a stakeholder as uh, shareholders and, and BlackRock and other companies do invest or look at us. So we manage and monitor our climate footprint very carefully, carbon footprint as well as electricity consumption. And we know per employee what is our consumption year on year. Uh, for instance, I know we consumed 86 million uh, kilowatt hours of uh, electricity across the IA group or 4.7 thousand uh, kilowatt hours per employee. So we've got to start here first and then look beyond. Uh, Rohan, can I turn to you? Uh, we have done a lot of work around sustainability. From the corporate governance side, how can we uh, raise the bar? <clears throat> well, uh, I, I would say there are many facets to raising the bar, but it also has to got to do from the private sector's point of view you know, uh, what I do, what is the benefit that I also get? I'm talking of in, in very general. Because today, sustainability, whilst it is a given in the private sector, there is also a cost attached to it. So from a private sector's perspective, whilst they would always want to uh, go up uh, further and higher and higher in the bar, in being more sustainable, in being more transparent, in being more uh, um, adhering more to the governance principles, it also means, you know, uh, what is the benefit that we would get? Now, you were talking of the green bond or the or, or climate fund. How accessible are these? How cumbersome are the procedures? Because today, for instance, if you want to be, say, compliant in terms of international certification of your products, there is a cost to it. So, ideally, this kind of this kind of uh, forum we need to embrace the smaller medium and small scale industries also for it to be really have that desired push so they are in in that context just to answer your question i feel whilst the bar has to be raised it also needs to encourage the the, uh, the private sector that uh, uh, whilst you have to be environmentally uh, correct in everything, social, where your social governance principles are concerned, when your environmental governance principles are concerned, that uh, there has also to be, to be, a, be the right framework for people to be encouraged to follow this procedure. Because uh, sustainability, whether you like it or not, has come to stay. And every one of us must jump the bandwagon sooner or later. And that's where, you know, whether it be green bonds or the, you know, uh, whatever financing that is available or for instance i can remember some time ago we i was involved with the united nations global compact we came to the central bank for seven eight, eight years ago about about uh, introducing uh, a sustainability index with the csc so uh, these are areas which will encourage the private sector to uh, you know align themselves with the national uh, development goals so uh, I don't know whether I answered you. Uh, just to add a couple of points, yeah, yeah, since you were yeah. talking about this. Now I believe that this should be one. Sorry, this should be one of the important topics in the boardroom also, which I, because I'm also sitting in a couple of boards, but I don't see that. Number two is even our strategic session, strategic planning sessions also. I'm sure that you know we must give some kind of prominence oh, okay. to this topic. Uh, okay. Now again, now that you raised that, uh, you are a chartered accountant and you have been president of the institute. Right, generally that agenda more or less is driven by the CFO sitting in the boardroom. Yeah. Right? Can there be a situation where you can start training the young people? Of course. To, and then also to take a long term view of a business. Certainly you yeah. can, but don't think the chartered accountants are typical number crunching people. Now if you take uh, <laughs> our good friend uh, Ranil Vijay <laughs> Singh, uh, even we sit in different places because as a result I am sure that we can do that. Okay. And we, we, we drive that, yeah. especially to, uh, to uh, nurture, uh, you know, uh, especially young chartered accountant, we do that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So that. Okay. Uh, 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 this, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize this question. There's a there's a view that banks now take a short term view. 
unlike before when you had these development banks and all that. So they are saying that the green, this green finance, blue bond initiatives and all will never work because banks take a, a short term view and that there is a need to change in the culture of these organizations, right? Then the reporting also comes in. How would you actually address this issue? I think the banks and other institutions will realize soon, even in the short term, this will be the, the you know, game in the town. So if you look at the demand and education awareness of this uh, sustainability, you can see when young and generation coming up, they are very concerned about this. Uh, you know, there, there will be, see, banks, why they are in short term? Because they, they think that right now there is no demand for their kind of products on, on that, uh, you know, towards that agenda. But you can see that is changing now. So it will come uh, some uh, in, in near future. Uh, when you promote businesses, when you introduce products, as I already mentioned somewhere, the, if there is no assurance of sustainability, you won't be able to market those products. So that will happen through the market forces. I think that's already happening. And pretty soon, that will be, it will have to be a mainstream part of the business. And that's why I think the point that was brought in the board, uh, in the board discussions and all the areas, this is coming up. You know, the, if banks want to be competitive in their businesses, they have to bring in this, the, this agenda. Otherwise, they, they will have to be you know, less competitive and they won't be able to continue uh, as much as, uh, you know, they are doing now. Uh, but there are a lot of other issues in the, I mean, uh, this is not the forum to talk about why they are taking short-term views, uh, especially because they come back in sector and those will also will have to be addressed. But this is... A